and saw how Juliet Prowse danced her way from South Africa as a young girl to London and Europe, and how she was brought to America to star in the motion picture Can Can and into the arms of America's leading heartthrobs. She later made it to Las Vegas, where she treated audiences to a dazzling exhibition of high-stepping dance styles with constant costume changes in high-priced productions in over 3,000 performances. Doing Irma in Las Vegas, I decided that's when I put my very first nightclub act together, uh, which Tony Charmley choreographed. And uh, that was a, a fun experience because we had a good company. I had five male dancers at that time. And uh, the first place we played the nightclub act was at the uh, Flamingo Hotel. Her manager at the time, Mark Mortar, suggested I do uh, a nightclub act for her. I was noted for doing working with many different stars. Tony Sharmely, choreographer to many famous dance. stars. So it seemed logical to come to me, and I had done so, so many things for Las Vegas, so Mark suggested that I do this. And uh, having seen Juliet and Can Can, I agreed we should do an act for Juliet. And uh, in thinking about what she should do, uh, one thing crossed my mind, I thought we'd better do something to prove to the uh, American audience that Juliet was indeed a very talented dancer, uh, one of the best we'd seen in this country in a long time. And uh, I thought we'd better do something to prove this to the audience rather than have them think that she was only Frank Sinatra's girlfriend and this is why she was getting to Las Vegas. So I thought for a bit and I thought one thing that would absolutely since the idea that she was an extremely talented dancer would be for her to dance on point. Well, when I suggested this to her, the groans were heard from here back to South Africa. So do I have to drag those things out again? I said, you must, because to an American audience, if you can get up on point, do pirouettes and balance and PK and do all these things, you are indeed a dancer. Secondly, not being Jewish, and she's not Jewish, we had to do something. It also helped cinch that. So I discovered that we should dance to the theme of Exodus. I said that's as close we could get as possible. So I did uh, the theme from Exodus. And Julia danced to that, and unquestionably a big hit in Las Vegas. And uh, I overheard people leaving the room saying, hmm. She really can dance. I said, there go the toe shoes. And on that first presentation in Las Vegas, Juliet proved to the American public that she was much, much more than Frank Sinatra's girlfriend. Juliet is, what? The best of the racehorse breed. She has uh, the body that a, div a dancer would kill for. She has... Uh, everything going for in the dance world. She's the only dancer that I also paint, that I have painted. And uh, I guess that's saying something. <laughs> in the interim, after establishing herself in Las Vegas as a dancer, Juliet was offered the chance of the lead role as an actress in a popular American television series called Mona McCluskey, which ran for one season. I woke you up. Don't you know you can't sneak around in GI boots? <laughs> hey, it's a glorious morning. Yeah, it is. I got a couple of days off. 
I feel as if I could bounce into orbit. Uh -huh. <laughs> hey, I like the planet I landed on. <laughs> Earth creature, you're out of this world. And there's plenty more where that came from, so you'll be home right after work. After the TV series was when I got the offer to do Sweet Charity in Las Vegas. I had to go to New York and audition for Sweet Charity, which I had never, ever done before. I'd never had to audition for anything other than when I was in London and still a dancer and establishing myself as a dancer. And uh, I was very nervous because uh, everyone was in the theater. I went to the Palace Theater in New York where Gwen Verdon was the star of Sweet Charity. And everyone was there, from her to Bob Fosse to Neil Simon to uh, Cy Coleman, Dorothy Fields, who wrote the music. And uh, I didn't have to dance. They didn't want me to dance because Fosse said, I don't need her to dance. She's fine. So uh, all they wanted me to do was sing, which I sang a song from Irma a cappella. I had no accompaniment. I just sang it and did it. And then I had to do a scene with the stage manager. And uh, I got the job. Thank goodness, because it was a, it was a, it was a great experience for me professionally. It gave me the chance to work with Fosse, whom uh, I just loved working with. He he was such an incredible director to work with for me. I had never really truly been directed. I mean, really directed in something. I was just kind of given my reins and let go and do. And therefore, I never really learned anything, except for like when I did the Mona McCluskey on television. At least every week, I had a chance to look at myself on the screen and realize my mistakes and what I was doing wrong and what I was doing right. And uh, it was very successful. We went into Caesar's Palace. Caesar's Palace was, had just been open like a, a month. And we went in and uh, we were there for six months. I did charity twice a night, every night. I used to have a day off every two weeks. And uh, we did six months of that. The people who own Caesar's Palace were really upset because initially they only wanted to put it in for three months. And the producers of Sweet Charity said, you must take it for six months or nothing. And they grudgingly said, oh, all right. Well, it, they had such a success on their hands that they could have killed themselves because they could have run it for a year easily with no problem. <laughs> anyway, closing night, we did the last show, and I think we only did one show that night. And they rolled up, they opened up the back, but they flew up the big thing, drop in the back, and they rolled, rolled out this uh, Jaguar Sports, which was a present for me. Oh, it was great. They just, rolled, just drove it up onto stage, and there it was. <laughs> it was my present for the six months that I had done the show there. So that was pretty terrific. <laughs> I remember when I was in charity, this, was, this will give you an example of Bob Farsi. He said to me, you seem to have forgotten the title of the show you're doing. He said, the title is Sweet Charity. It's not Funny Charity. That's what happens. Many times you get into, especially a situation when you're doing something twice a night, every night. You start hearing the laughs, and so you embellish. And before you know it, what was just a wonderful moment has just become this big, you know. And uh, he made me really pull back. And I really didn't experience it properly until I went to London and did charity in London. Uh, and that was my first uh, uh, real theater situation of doing a show, and particularly doing that show. And being able to, as he used to say to me, you must always remember that there's a fourth wall. The audience is there, but it's a fourth wall. You are in a room. The wings are the walls, the back is a wall, and the front is a wall, even though it's open to an audience who are viewing you. He says, so you must try and think of yourself as being in that place and not just being out there all the time. After I did charity in London, I went to what is now the Hilton. And it was then called the International. And I did another Broadway show, Maine, there for eight weeks and in that show I met my Seth's father, my husband, my ex, John McCook, and uh, he was playing my nephew in the show and uh, we married about a year and a half later. Juliet and John had a son from their marriage, Seth, who was very proud of his mother. She had an army dance. She was Miss Universe, something like that. The riches, the millionaire, and she just, they, they had these three girls, my mom's dancers, and the 
the guys, my mom's moon dancers, and they they were all dressed up in army uniforms and in playing poker at the table, and then the three girls start singing and saying, here's Miss Universe, <laughs> and then she walks out and they do all this music, and then they're all talking and they do all this stunt work, so it looks like stunt work, but it's just dancing. <laughs> And at the end, at the end, they put a alarm. Cause she, she, she's singing. At first, she's singing. I wish I had a man, something like that. And she came up, and that's when they were all doing all the crazy things. And then the alarm went off that the Japanese or whoever they were fighting were attacking. And so that's when it was funny. I didn't take too much time off after I had Seth. I. Uh, I was performing. I did a TV show two months after I had him, dancing on a television show. I was kind of buxom because I was feeding him at that time. And uh, I had, uh, so I had, for the first time in my life, I gave Marilyn Monroe a run for her money. <laughs> I gave quite a few people a run for their money. <laughs> But I was back working, right, like I was back in classes like two, three weeks after I had him. Uh, which is actually the best thing I could have done because it, it, it pulled everything together very quickly. And uh, I thought at first when I had him and I looked at my body and I think, ju I've w I think just about every woman in the world who has a child must go through this. You look at your stomach and you go, oh, it's never going to go away, <laughs> you know. But it can. It, boy, if you work at it, it'll go away. You just have to work hard at it. You can't sit around and expect it to do it by itself. <laughs> One show business engagement that never ended in marriage was that between Juliet and Frank Sinatra. Here's Juliet's story of how they became engaged. Well, it's a very funny story. I had... Uh, I... <laughs> oh, we're going into my love life here. I had been dating Frank for quite a while, and I met a young dancer who was terrific looking. And uh, we started having a love affair. And one night I was in my apartment with this boy, and uh, it was two o'clock in the morning, and I hear Frank on my door, banging on my door, Juliet! And he'd been out to some party, and he was 10 sheets to the wind, I think. And uh, the, this boy said to me, who's that? I said, shh. <laughs> so he kept on and on and on and on banging. Eventually he got in his car and he buzzed off. Ten minutes later, the phone rings and hits, it's his secretary. And she says, you better get out of the house because Frank's going to bomb the house. And I said, what? She said, just get yourself and whoever is with you out of the house. So we get dressed and we go out and we're sitting. 2.30 in the morning, we're sitting on the pavement. And all of a sudden I go, wait a minute, who does he think he is? I go back into the house, I get him on the phone, and I let him have it. Because when I get mad, especially when I was young, I would just go, Bleh! and it would all come out. And I hung up the phone, and I said, that's it. And I didn't see him for six months. Not a thing, never said anything. And I was in New York six months later doing a Perry Como show. And I was in some hotel uh, suite and the telephone rang and it was Frank. And he said, hi, how are you? Just like it was yesterday, you know. And I never hold grudges or anything. And I said, I'm fine. How are you? What you doing? Da, 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 da. And we talked and talked. He said, when are you coming home? And I said, and I told him when I was coming home. And he said, what plane? Da, 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 da. He said, I'll meet you. I said, oh, okay. And he himself, which he never does, met me at the airport all by himself. Picked me up, got me in the car. He said, I have a present for you. And I said, oh. And he gave me this little box and it was a diamond ring. And he said, what do you think? Well, I was flabbergasted, you know. And I said, well, I guess so. <laughs> And that's how I got engaged to him. <laughs> I'm sure that in this documentary, uh, the name Frank Sinatra has come up. And uh, 
I'm sure everyone tells what they know of the relationship between Juliet and Frank Sinatra. I just want to, uh, for the record, because I don't know if Juliet would explain this or if, or if anybody else would, but for the record, I'd like it to be known that this was a very genuine relationship between these two people, and they were very serious about uh, marriage. It was an old-fashioned engagement ring with an old-fashioned engagement and marriage plans. The, the number one reason why this didn't come off was that Frank Sinatra, as a definite condition to a marriage, did not want his wife to be a working wife, whether it be a performer or a businesswoman. And uh, he had asked Juliet to give up her career. And she felt, after having studied and worked uh, so long, that she just couldn't do that. And that, in my opinion, was the one main factor for their not getting married. In fact, it was quite touching. Juliet was very young at the time, and so was I. Uh, but I remember when we drove up to Frank's house, and she snuck in and returned his engagement ring. She put it on his piano in the box that he had given it to her. So it was quite a touching moment. I, I always remember that. What is it that we live before? A flower's a flower. Nothing I know. Things on the floor. Like sweet a flower. You're thinking you're through. That nobody cares. And suddenly you. Here it's been starting. And someone charging. Apart from such very public personal experiences as getting engaged to Frank Sinatra and a close friendship with Elvis Presley, her career also afforded her opportunities to entertain and meet three American presidents. Well, the very first time I performed for a president, I was uh, dating Sinatra at the time. And it was for Kennedy's inauguration. And that was a real big deal. That really was because we all went to Washington and there were a lot of people in that show, a lot of stars. And I did a uh, dance number with four boys and um, it was done in a huge arena. I've forgotten exactly where it was done but in this very, very big arena. And the stage was set up in the middle of the arena and then the president and his first lady were sitting up on a balcony. And um, it was a very exciting evening. I had met him because he was friends with Sinatra and Sinatra was friends with Peter Lawford who was married to Kennedy's sister and all of that kind of stuff. So I was around him socially uh, about three, four times and uh, he was a very charming man. Wonderful charisma, very attractive, um, great um, joie de vivre and uh, he was a really super guy. Then the next president we, I performed for was uh, Nixon. I was doing a show downtown here in Los Angeles called Cavalcade of the Stars. And uh, an, an, another actor, Bob Wright and myself, were the MCs of the show, plus being in the show and doing uh, parts in the show. And it was a conglomeration of different uh, bits from different shows and uh, dance numbers and musical numbers and all that, that kind of stuff thrown together. And one night, um, Nixon and uh, Pat came to see the show. We didn't meet them, though. We didn't meet them afterwards. And then just last year, I was given the opportunity to go to Washington and do a show that was televised for the president. And it was shot in the Ford Theater where Lincoln was assassinated. From the musical Sweet Charity came the song that my friends could see me now. Here to perform it for us is the lovely Juliette Prouse.
But it was a lovely experience, and we did get to meet, in fact, twice. Before the show, we were invited to the White House, where I had never, ever been. And um, we were presented, the, those of us who were on the show, got to meet uh, the president and the lady, first lady. And then he made a speech. And he has a wonderful sense of humor, you know, great sense of humor. He's a very funny man. He said some, some very cute things to all of us. And then we all went off, and we did the show. And then afterwards, he came up onto stage and met us all, so that's all on the film. We have all of that.
Over the years, Las Vegas has had seven of its own award presentations, the Entertainer of the Year Award. This is presented to stars who provided outstanding entertainment on a Las Vegas stage. Juliet Prowse is the proud owner of no fewer than four of these seven awards. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I was... Um... They don't really have that anymore, although last year I just won an award. No, what last year? This year I just won an award in Atlantic City for Entertainer of the Year, which was kind of nice. And, but in Vegas they used to have, like for oh, well, seven years running, they had award shows. They decided one day that they, Las Vegas needed its own award show and presentations to companies and lead dancers, lead performers, production numbers, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was very lucky. I won it four times. In London, she also won the Woman of the Year Award. I was in London doing Sweet Charity when the, um, the awards came about. Sweet Charity, at, at, at that time it was the equivalent of, in, on Broadway they have what they call the Tonys, which is all the um, shows that are on, on Broadway. And they had this the year that I was there with Charity. And uh, we lost, Charity lost to Fiddler on the Roof. But I won as a uh, Woman of the Year. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but I won it. I would like to thank all the readers of the Atlantic City magazine for selecting me as Entertainer of the Year in my category. I would also like to thank all of the staff at the Sands Hotel and really look forward to seeing you all there again on August the 11th. And once again, thank you. Juliet's acceptance speech for her most recent award, the Entertainer of the Year in Atlantic City, another famous entertainment resort on America's East Coast. And back in Las Vegas on a sidewalk, on the very famous strip, Juliet was honored when her name and handprints were recorded for the Stars Hall of Fame. My idea was for her to dance the bolero. And she said, wonderful, that's what, I just love the bolero. How much of it? And I said, the entire thing. Quickly, typical of a manager, uh, how long is it? I said, 15 minutes long. A 15-minute number in a nightclub that is unheard of. Will it hold? I said, Mark, anything will hold if it's good enough. Now you know the outcome. The bolero was danced by Juliet to standing ovations every night. She could not be booked for years unless she included the bolero in the presentation. Uh, in Los Angeles at the Coconut Grove, a separate stage was built for Juliet. Never had been done in the history of nightclub. The stage was built in adjacent to the one that was there now, and Juliet presented the bolero on a separate stage away from the main stage. It was the first time ever done. I went back to Las Vegas subsequently, and one time I went with Shirley MacLaine because I was going to do Shirley MacLaine's television special. And she had heard so much about the bolero, wanted to see it. So I went with her and she saw it. Indeed, she agreed that it was a tremendous work for Juliet. And uh, we went backstage afterwards. And of course, when I walked into the dressing room with Juliet, she said, you, I can't quote everything, you, I'm going to be dancing this bolero until I'm 110 years old. Everybody wants the bolero, the bolero. Well, I don't think anybody could do the bolero. It was designed for her, and uh, I hope she does continue to dance it until she's 110. Naturally, Juliet's costumes play an integral part in her acts. The name of the man who guns her, Bob Mackey, is synonymous with glamour. He's known in Hollywood as designer to the stars, winner of four Emmy Awards and twice nominated for an Oscar. Bob Mackey created costumes for Judy Garland, Barbara Streisand, Anne Margaret, Mitzi Gaynor, Carol Burnett, Diana Ross, Liza Minnelli, and many more. Designing for Juliet is, I mean, everybody must say that, it's a joy. You know, there's never a problem. Uh, you can do the most elaborate, the most 
bizarre looking costumes for her and if it's right for what she's doing she'll do everything she can to make it work and uh, if she want, has to change in uh, you know, 15 seconds she'll go off stage change wig costume shoes the whole works and be back uh, people don't I mean they think it was two girls there they, they can't believe that uh, that it's one woman doing the changes she's that professional I think that comes from being a performer early on she was a, a professional at, well, when she was a teenager so and she was in shows that required that kind of thing so she's she's very together she doesn't always know what she wants but she knows what it has to do and it's very important uh, for her kind of work and she really dances I mean there are dancers in this business that put on a costume and they kind of prance around and the boys lift them up and set them down and and move them over here and move them over there and they don't really do anything and you just make them look gorgeous with Juliet she really does the work sometimes uh, the, my only criticism of Juliet is sometimes she doesn't act enough like a star well she's terrific to work with you know except that you always have to make her comfortable so she can really dance you know everything should stretch and should move and uh, otherwise she'll do anything and I mean and wear anything at all I mean if the situation calls for it there's no stop to it you know there's never well she looks best the least she has on you know she's one of those people that you know she looks really the least she has on the more wonderful she looks we got to know each other doing a um, a musical in London at the Phoenix Theatre I do I do I must say that on a business level Juliet is about the most professional actress or actor I've ever worked with and besides she's nice and tall I must tell you also it was we laughed about it later on but um, I had done I do I do with with Carol Burnett the year before and then this thing situation arose in, in London um, but Carol was not available uh, so who to get to to play Agnes and uh, I was trying to think and my agents were trying to think of tall ladies because I'm tall and if you have Mutt and Jeff on the stage that doesn't work too well and uh, <coughs> uh, her agent called and said would you consider Julia Prowse well terrific but I didn't know Juliet I only I know her work as a dancer uh, a singer in her Vegas act but I didn't know her act her work as an actress well it turns out to make a long dull story short I went up with my agent to Vegas as it turns out to audition Juliet Prowse I mean you don't do that to Juliet Prowse but there it was and we she didn't know what to say and I didn't know what to say and we enjoyed the act and uh, had a bite to eat and back on the plane I went back to, uh, to uh, Los Angeles to go back to work and I said to myself I was auditioning Julia Prowse I mean you you audition unknowns to see what they were but you know what her work is and I grew to love her and I do love her uh, we've rem remained fairly close friends uh, our work takes us there and there so we don't really see each other that much I saw her last night as a matter of fact she's here in town I'm here in town shooting and um, but when we are in town we see each other and have a terrific time and enjoy uh, an evening together like most people Juliet has her pastimes and recreations, except that in the case of yoga, these exercises are very beneficial to a dancer. About six years ago, a friend of mine, a dancer, came up to me and said, Juliet, you must come to yoga, you're going to love it. And I said, uh, okay, because I'm willing to try anything. And I went with her and I just slipped, went right into it. Um, a lot of things were very hard for me to do because uh, I've always had a lot of bad back trouble so uh, in yoga you do a lot of lot of back exercises so I would feel that a lot and also a couple of things were hard for me to do because from ballet you're so used to being turned out and in yoga you do things parallel 
So it was, all, it was a, a different balance for me, getting used to balancing with my feet forward instead of being turned out all the time. And uh, I found it wonderful. There's a great feeling when you finish. It's a very hard class, the particular class that I do. And, uh, and there are all kinds of people from all walks of life in the class and all ages. And it's so beneficial for them because doing yoga is so very good for your back, for your spine. And if you keep a young spine, a flexible spine, you're going to keep young your whole life physically. Eight years ago when Juliet came first to my, my class, she had so many injuries after dancing for so many years, all of her life, you know. One day she, you have to stop because body doesn't go anymore, you know. So because she came to my class and slowly yoga helps her to recover from all those injuries. And then after that she's keep doing with yoga and her keep dancing until today. That's why she's still dancing. If she didn't meet me, maybe today she cannot dance anymore because of those injuries. I've been around the world, so a lot of dancers, you know, but I think Juliet is the best dancer in the world I know because what she does on the stage I don't think any human being can do it and I really still don't know how she does it But unlike most people, Juliet is crazy about roller coaster rides and spends many exhilarating hours in American amusement parks. My uh, love for theme parks goes back from uh, uh, way back. I think everyone has loves amusement parks. Everyone loves the rides and all of that kind of stuff. The rides uh, that they have here in America, of course, are incredible. Magic Mountain has the most incredible I mean, I don't know how they, whoever thought of constructing these things to begin with. They have the revolution, which is uh, wonderful because it's a very fast, it, that particular ride moves very quickly. And the first two dips on it are just, it took me about four or five times before I could open my eyes and even look at them. There is one ride that I still have not been able to open my eyes on, and that is at Knott's Berry Farm and that is called Montezuma's Revenge. And what it is, is you are strapped in this, this uh, train and you are literally catapulted out of, of I, I don't know how fast, I mean it goes at something like 50 miles an hour within the first two seconds, it just catapults you out. And the first thing you see in front of you is this revolution, a backwards one. So you, you get spun backwards and you go on the wheel backwards and then you go through up this huge incline in front of you and then you stop at it because the impetus is finished and then you come catapulting down and then you do the revolution the other way around and then you go up another incline on the other end and then you stop and then you come into the station and this thing just goes boom and you stop there and you just, and the whole thing's taken about three seconds to do <laughs> and you, I tell you I came off of that I could hardly walk my legs were like jelly <laughs> Although Juliet Prowse is a famous star and known as one of the best dancers in the world, she's nevertheless still regarded as a regular girl and not really a part of the Hollywood scene. She's been criticized by people in show business for not running around with the Hollywood and Broadway producers and not acting enough like a star. She loves doing her own housework and gardening at her house, surrounded by those of other stars in Los Angeles. One of the biggest things, one of the things why I make it a point to do a lot of things myself. I make it a point to go in the garden and work and hurt and get my fingers all bunged up and bruised and, and I do work around the house and I cook and I do all those things because I don't want to lose any sense of reality because it's so easy in this business and in Los Angeles to just live in a little cocoon and everything's nice and everyone does that and everyone does that and you forget how the world lives. The world doesn't live this way. This is the un unrealistic. The outside is the realistic world. What if everything was taken away from me tomorrow? Could I go back to what I was when I was living in a room in Chelsea? And I know that I, could, uh, that I can.
I know I can. Because I haven't lost sense of reality. I think about it every once in a while, and every once in a while I'll say to my boyfriend, you want to come move down to South Africa and we'll open up a dance school? I'll teach ballet and you can teach all the modern. I don't know, who knows? You never know in this, in this life where are you going to be. I always say, well, when I go home, uh, and that means South Africa. This tree. One day when it really takes over, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But it's so pretty. It's a jacaranda. Hasn't bloomed yet, though. Maybe it's just something in disguise, pretending to be a jacaranda. <laughs> I got my green peppers, my cherry tomatoes, which are doing not that great, and my zucchini not doing that great either. There are entertainers that, uh, that I've seen over the years that know how to, how to milk, you know, applause, give me more applause, and they'll just stand there. And by the very nature of how they stand, the very nature of how they bow, and the very nature of how they do things, they encourage an audience to applaud more than they might necessarily do. There are other entertainers that are, are well known for eliciting or soliciting standing ovations from an audience, whereas they might not on their own merits receive. They have their little tricks and their ways of doing things. Juliet is just the opposite. Juliet gets standing ovations on her own and then turns and includes her entire company of dancers and whoever else might be on stage and says, how about my group, ladies and gentlemen, aren't they wonderful? Thank you. How about my company, ladies and gentlemen? Aren't they sensational? Right. I think, basically, she works, works too hard sometimes. Uh, what I mean is... David Chavez, Juliet's current choreographer. Gives out so much energy, she beco her body becomes tense. And instead of being something for her to work with, she becomes so tense that her joints become very brittle. And uh, she can't execute and dance as well as she could because she's, she's putting out so much energy that she becomes stiff. And even, even now, as long as we've worked, I ha sometimes have to remind her, please relax. You're giving too much energy. And as soon as she relaxes, everything becomes fluid, calm, the placement is correct, and the phrasing becomes second nature to her. But what happens is it's just something that's inside her. She feels she has to push. And I'm constantly reprimanding her about it. For a choreographer, she's the ideal tool. I mean, she, I can do anything with her at any time, at any place. And I know about 30 choreographers that would die to do what I just got a chance to do, and I really appreciate it. A great deal of perspiration and hard work has led to Juliet's very successful career lasting for almost 30 years. Although she's best known as a modern jazz dancer, Juliet still attends ballet classes every day at a famous Los Angeles school of ballet. And she's still executing the ballet steps and combinations brilliantly, and isn't daunted by the fact that she's about 20 years older than anyone else in this class. One wonders when this dancer is going to hang up her dancing shoes.
in the classroom. She's very professional, which is so important to have this uh, this work. She's a workforce. You know, she doesn't uh, she doesn't mark anything. Or if she, and it's, even then, sometimes she's in a lot of great deal of pain. She she has this uh, difficulty in doing certain things. She'll stop sometimes, but mainly she'll she'll try and keep going. And I'm just glad that I feel that she's doing a little less performing now, which I think is good. She's worked so hard all her life that I feel that she should be, you know, having some sort of a rest now. She deserves it. She's given. When she does give now, she, even, you know, today on televisions and things like that, she's just sensational. She's a million bucks. I, I rate her at 10. <laughs>